Hey, fellas. Hopefully the modem is warmed up. It won't buffer in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Wash us in the blood of my God and save Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Fill us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yeah, Lord, Father, Spirit. What's up, guys? <clears throat> nice to see you. Anna Groong. Always have our time pronouncing your name. 303 Polski Bomboywicz. Neta, what's up, sister? What it is? Some of your names I can't pronounce. 303 Polski Bomboywicz. Man, I have two. Candace, I miss me too. <laughs> Just kidding, Candace. Well, Anna Groong, believe it or not, I want to make a confession. I was never stylish in the way I dress because I didn't have anyone teach me how to style and profile, right? So that's one of those areas I lack, which is ironic, though. You know what's ironic? My dad was very dapper. My dad would always wear suits or at least a nice dress shirt, dress pants, dress shoes, right? So he knew how to dress, my dad. Unfortunately, he didn't pass those jeans on to me. <clears throat> he didn't pass it on to me because... Boy, when it comes to matching clothes, I am blind. You're always on my mind. I was blind. You're always on my mind. I'm just waiting a few more minutes for the regulars to show up. Pray in Jesus' name. The numbers increase. Hit that like button. Subscribe. Pray the Lord Jesus protects us from satanic attacks and assaults. Purified in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Cleansed. Washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Sealed by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, wash us, cleanse us, purify us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue, cleanse and purify the words of my mouth and my tongue in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Anoint me to speak truth without error, <clears throat> filling me with, with the health I need, filling my lungs and my chest and my throat with, with the health I need from the Holy Spirit, saving me from confusion, stammering, <clears throat> from misinterpretation and perfecting my ability to recall the passages for the glory of the Lord Jesus, the Father's heart that became flesh, the Father's beloved that became flesh, the eternal Son that became flesh. May the Father of the Lord Jesus bless everyone. Wash everyone. Wash me, every one of you, our loved ones, my daughters, in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and fill us with the Spirit. Clothe us with the Spirit. Seal us by the Spirit. Energize us by the Spirit. <clears throat> Anoint us by the Spirit. To glorify you, Father. To glorify the Lord Jesus. To glorify the Holy Spirit. Save me from error, stammering, and confusion. And bless everyone to understand with wisdom from the Spirit. Life from the Spirit. Power from the Spirit. Fruit from the Spirit. Love from the Spirit. Knowledge from the Spirit. Understanding from the Spirit, Father. Not just for them, but for me. May the Lord Jesus increase in every one of, every one of us. Loosen my tongue, Holy Spirit. Father, may the Lord Jesus increase in every one of us. May he sit in throne. Upon our hearts, the hearts of our loved ones, the hearts of my daughters. May he increase in my daughters. Drown them, drown us and our loved ones in your infinite love and compassion and mercy. In the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, in your living waters, the Holy Spirit. Have your way, Father, we love you. Have your way, Lord Jesus, we love you. Have your way, Holy Spirit, we love you. And help me not to be unnecessarily offensive and not to be a stumbling block to my neighbors, Father. Use me to not only reach people here or those who will come later to listen, but my neighbors, they'll see Jesus shining in us, doers of your word, empowered by your spirit to live your word, to love your word, to proclaim your word, and die for your word without compromise. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. We love you. Thank you for being patient with us and forgiving us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you. <clears throat> Clear my throat and anoint, this, anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Holy Spirit. We need you. We need you. Save us from Satan and the world and from our flesh. And finish the work you've begun in us for the glory of Jesus. In Jesus' name, Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. The apologists getting together? I don't know what you mean. Folks, as you can... <clears throat> Remember, what was it? Monday was it or Tuesday? When we had that very super intense session that lasted over two hours and 30 minutes on the prologue of John and how John identifies the Lord Jesus Christ in his narrative as that very eternal divine word. 
showing the word is that eternal divine person who became the flesh and blood human being Jesus Christ of Nazareth so that the eternal word is an actual person that became the Lord Jesus Christ right was it Monday when was it <clears throat> was it Monday I don't remember was it Monday yeah. or was it Tuesday you guys any who remembers who remembers what day it was Tuesday right I had planned after that attack we had the demons come out and manifest sons of Satan dogs of Satan attacked like it was going out of style which was a sign that Jesus Christ was being glorified by the part of the Holy Spirit and I had planned to do a session the very next day uh, what was it Wednesday but guess what happened the attacks of Satan started during the live stream and it didn't stop so that for the past two days, Satan has attacked me to try to cause me to fall into depression and sadness and feel defeated until by the grace of the Lord Jesus, by the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Father of our Lord Jesus has restored me and energized me and reinvigorated me. See, the attacks are nonstop. Right? The attacks are nonstop, honestly. And you know what Satan uses? This is why, guys, I'm going to remind you again. Please, if you love me for the sake of Jesus, covenant with me and pray intensely, fast intensely for my daughters and I. Because you know how he gets me? He uses the innocence of my daughters to cause me to fall into depression because I can't do anything for them. I can't protect them. I can't watch over them. So I have to learn to let go and trust Jesus to fight for them. And humble their mother to fear and repent before the Lord Jesus. So he used my beautiful daughters to cause me to fall into depression. Because I am hurt for them. I'm angry for them. I'm depressed for them. Not me. Because I'm their Bob and I want to protect them. And Jesus is showing me I got to be patient. And it's killing me. I've been waiting for over two years, guys. So that's what Satan does. So rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus. Plead the blood of Jesus over my daughters. No harm comes upon them. Because that's how he gets me. Right? unfortunately so that's what happened that's why i've been out of commission for two days if you wonder why that's why god bless you Assyrian fighter for christ <clears throat> now i'm trying to wait a few minutes to see if any more agents of the devil will manifest so we can start blocking so please admins once you see someone distracting and attacking or blaspheming, get rid of him right away. Get rid of her right away. Okay. Recovering, Chris Dino. Recovering. It's not easy when your daughters want to see you so badly and they have another man in the home that's not their father and their father dying inside because he can't protect them and be a godly influence showing them the lord jesus showing that their mother is doing is immoral it's hard brother it's hard and that's how satan attacks me okay pray though god is not leaving their mother alone he is allowing her life to be hell and miserable until she breaks before the feet of jesus right so pray for me please i need it guys guys i need your prayers and your fasting please i do we are human we are flesh and we can fail Jesus, shame Jesus, and walk away. God forbid, may it never happen, unless the Holy Spirit fills us and seals us and the blood of Jesus washes. Please pray for me. Okay. Just looking at the comments, we're about to begin. You are my brothers. God bless you, Chris Dino. God bless every one of you, all of you. And praise the Lord, the mods are here. First last is here, everyone's here. Pray, guys. It's hard. Two days. Two days, man. It was hard. I was planning to come Wednesday, but you know, Satan tried to distract. But glory to Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, who has crushed Muhammad, damned Muhammad to hell, that filthy dog of Satan. Glory to Jesus Christ. See, because a Muhammad showed up mocking again. Hey, you kidding me? Acts 17 apologetics. My brother from a different mother, not only does he hate on me and doesn't send 
subscribers or viewers so I can get about a thousand. But at least he supports me, sends me hundred bucks. And by the way, David, I need to collect it. For the past several months, I've been getting super chat. I haven't collected. First last sent me a link where I have to download an app. Guys, pray I intentionally do that to collect your blessings to the ministry because that's your blessing to the ministry. And don't forget, Lord willing, tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll be joining David Wood live. 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow. Yeah, guys, I need to. This is where, again, and David will tell you, Carly, this is where, again, I am like the rain man of apologetics because when it comes to things outside my interest, it's like you got to pull teeth for me to do it. And I pray that God will save me from that. I hope it's not laziness, but let's call it what it is. Doing stuff outside of my interest, it's like pulling teeth. And you would think, and this is no, I don't mean to be disrespectful. God bless you guys for supporting me via Super Chat. That I would be intentional in getting the app to collect. But it's like stuff I think like, oh, man, that's going to waste 20 minutes, 20 minutes or 30 minutes that I can be writing or reading or live streaming or sitting on my bed watching YouTube videos or watching comedy. But anyway. Thank you, guys. All you super chatters, God bless you. The Lord Jesus reward you for your love and support. Sophia, keep praying. Pray and fast for us that God will protect us. That's more than enough. I don't have biceps yet this year in Fighter for Christ. I haven't been in the gym even though I've been doing cardio. That's why I got to now increase it so I can lose love handles nobody loves to handle. <laughs> Thank you, Riaz. I don't care what they say about you in Discord, Riaz, Qureshi. You're okay in my book. Folks, before I begin, just to let you know, we're about to begin. <clears throat> Pray we get about 300 in Jesus' name. Uh, you've heard about Ravi Zacharias. <clears throat> the diagnosis is, unless the Lord Jesus does something miraculous, <clears throat> his homecoming may be soon. The Lord may be calling him home soon. The cancer has spread, and the doctor said we can't do anything about it. So bar a miracle from the Lord Jesus, he'll be going home to be with Jesus. <clears throat> yep. Ravi Zacharias. He just announced it. His daughter did. Sarah, I think her name's Sarah. <clears throat> this is the way of all the earth, folks. This is the way. Thank you, sister. Steffi, Steph. Thank you. This is the way of all the earth. Folks, let me re remind you. This is the way of all the earth. Every one of us, every one of us must die until Jesus comes, some sooner than later. Ravi's home going isn't as tragic a loss for us as Nabil Qureshi, because Nabil Qureshi was 34. Ravi is 74. He's lived a full life, and he's done ministry for a long time. But when you have someone young dying, <clears throat> like Nabil, who left behind a two-year-old daughter, Aya, that's more tragic and heart-wrenching for those of us who are on earth. <clears throat> right? <clears throat> Man, I shouldn't be drinking lemon water. Not good for my throat. Are we ready to begin? Are we ready to begin? Because I want to do John 5, 26, because that came up last time. And I'm going to address some of the things that wicked, by the way, folks, let me say something. Help me to help you. Help me to help you. If you help me to help you, you'll be blessed. I don't want you to believe what I believe. I want you to believe what the Holy Spirit wants you to believe because anything from the Holy Spirit is perfect. It's true. So if the Spirit enables me to interpret scriptures correctly, my prayer is that the Spirit will confirm it in your hearts. If I'm mistaken, may the Spirit save you from my mistakes and convict me to show me where I'm mistaken and not repeat it, okay? So hear me out. Go back prayerfully. Look over the material. If you disagree with me, amen, but keep it to yourself, okay? Here's how you won't get me to listen. Here's how you won't get me to listen. Honestly, if you come on my comment section and you start pontificating, you're going to get blocked because I keep telling people, I don't read lengthy comments. Why? Because I spend most of my time writing and reading. I get tired and it burdens me to have to go through a comment that's lengthy. 
I won't read it. Okay. Admins, you're not quick enough. You have a Muhammad in here, right? A dog of Muhammad. Come on, admins, quicker. Okay. So that's not how you're going to get my attention. Okay. You won't get my attention by challenging me or saying I'm wrong. If you want to debate me, set up a time. We'll go and I'll debate. If it's a topic worth debating. Okay. Moreover, help me here because I read the comments. The reason why I read the comments, comments is for feedback. I want to make sure I'm not confusing you. You're getting the point. And if you're struggling, that I'll see where you're struggling. Hopefully, I can be used of the spirit to help you overcome your struggles to understand. Okay. But do not pontificate in the comment section. Do not go into side tangents in the comment section because that's going to earn you a block. Okay. Just want just want to be clear. Please help me to help you. Help me to help you. And a final thing. Here's the final thing. Don't assume that when I treat a wicked, blasphemous, anti-Trinitarian harshly, that I'm just doing it for no reason, and I'm just doing it at the moment without any prior history or interaction with that anti-Trinitarian. David Wood is a heretic, but I carry him for the sake of the Lord because I'm hoping that God will use me to to sanctify him by the power of the Holy Spirit and save him from his heresies, his arrogance, his dictatorial spirit. So I put up with him. Him I'll put up with. But now, okay, what do I mean? That Tuesday, the gentleman who went by the moniker E.E., -E, and I forgot what the last name was. You don't know the history. You don't know this guy's a stalker. The gentleman who is a wicked, rabid, anti-Trinitarian demon, who hates the Trinity, stalks David Wood's YouTube sessions, his live streams, stalks me and keeps egging us on to refute his arguments and to debate Greg Stafford. He's been doing it for a period of time. So when he was here on my channel and I invite him to call, I treated him like the dog that he is because he's demonstrated he's a rabid anti-Trinitarian who hates the Trinity because he's of the devil. So don't Chime in and tell me you're too mean, you're too harsh, you're not giving him a chance because you don't know the history. You do not know the history. You do not know if I've interacted with this person beforehand and that this person has demonstrated and shown that he's a wicked, filthy, rabid dog of the devil who hates the Trinity and wants to rob Jesus of his glory. So when you're a dog, I will do what the Bible says, treat you as you deserve to send you back to your vomit. See? Because people say, why did you give it? Because you don't know who he was. And you saw his deceptive tactic. Like this filthy dog of Muhammad. Muhammad was a dog of Satan. He comes under different nicks and he keeps bombarding the text. Ultimate demon. He's got no life because he's not able to go out and do jihad, murder men, rape women and do muta because he's locked in his house because of COVID-19. You see? So he wants to take out his anger on us. Ultimate demon. You want me there? Okay. So don't chime in. Don't tell me, Sam, that's not how you should treat this guy. Give him a chance to talk. You don't know. Sit back. Enjoy the ride. Listen. And then when I'm wrong, may the Lord Jesus in his mercy correct me and sanctify me and change me. But give me the benefit of doubt. And if you don't like my approach, let me repeat it again. If you don't like my approach, that's fine. Just like people can't stand uh, David Wood, think he's this arrogant dictator and an ugly white supremacist. And there's some truth to some of that. But there are other people who like him. Likewise, not everyone's going to be drawn to me. Not everyone's going to like me. God raises up a plethora of teachers to draw different people to themselves so that God will raise up a Samuel Green for those people who like that kind of approach. Then God will raise up white supremacist dictators like David Wood for those people who like to be controlled and told what to do. 
So I may not be your cup of tea. That's fine. Go somewhere else. I won't lose sleep. I won't be hurt. All right? Now that said, are we ready? Can we begin now with all those rules in mind? Can we now begin? And now as I begin, pray God will invigorate me and refresh me because it's been two days of just emotional onslaught. Okay. Let's begin. Thank you, squeeze me, Jibril. Okay. Now watch the demons start manifesting. Watch the demons start manifesting. Now let me go back and cover John 5 to 526 with greater depth because this usually comes up by anti-Trinitarians. I addressed it near the end of the session I did on Tuesday, but I felt compelled to just discuss this with greater de uh, depth by the grace of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus so that this objection will be put to rest and that you know how to address this objection and don't be troubled when an anti-Trinitarian misuses this passage to his shame and humiliation. Thank you, Jati. Are we ready now? So let's look at the passage and let's unpack the meaning of the passage and what the objection is. Okay, who's ready now? Are we ready? Can we focus? May the Lord bring them for his glory in Jesus' name. You, fought, you, sent, you sense a troll, a demon? Get him out of here. We don't want chaos like the session on Tuesday. Okay, John 5, 26. Let's read it. John 5, 26. No, Jojo, you either like me or you like David Wood. You can't like both, and I'm going to have to get rid of you. Okay. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Let me repeat the passage again. Are you ready? Guys, hit that like button for, so we can make this go viral for the glory of Christ. Okay. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Okay. Does anyone spot the objection? Does anyone remember or spot the objection with John 5, 26? Anybody? Post it again, Protestant believer. And God bless you for helping us. No, not life in himself. The Father has life in himself too, Satu. Some of you saw it. What's the objection? Yes. Sophia, not life to Jesus. It doesn't say he gave life to Jesus. Yep. Sola Scriptura. But it doesn't say he gave life to Jesus. Yep. Now you guys got it. Here's the objection. How can Jesus be God if the Father gave him to have life in himself? Because God is self-existent, what we call a seity. God exists apart from anything and anyone, doesn't need anyone for his existence, and doesn't depend on anyone for his existence. So if Jesus is God, why would the Father need to give Jesus life in himself? Thank you, Matt. God bless you. Right? Do you understand the objection now? Lord bless you, all you super chatters. God bless you for your love and support. By the grace of God, I'm going to try to collect it this weekend. Please, Lord Jesus. Does everyone understand what the objection is? Yeah. Michelle, you can spout the creeds all you want. Until you prove it exegetically, all you're doing is appealing to creeds that they reject. You get my point? You can tell me what you believe and cite the creeds till the cows come home. Until you prove your case exegetically, you're doing nothing because not everyone believes in the creeds. Right? That's why they're anti Trinitarian. If they believe the creeds, they would be Trinitarians, right? Thank you, Carly. Everyone with me there? Are you ready for meat? Because this is not going to be milk. I'm going in meat by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is now meat, guys. We're going in meat. Okay. <clears throat> now, how do they interpret John 5 26? They interpret it to mean that the son was given life in the sense that the father brought the son into being. Okay. The father brought the son into being. That's how they're interpreting the Lord's words 
The son has life in himself, meaning he lives because the father gave him life and brought him into being. Now let's refute that objection. Okay, are we ready now? Let's refute that objection. Number one, having life in himself doesn't mean the father brought the son into being. That's not what it means. In the context of John 5, and I'm going to prove my point. If you're just patient and work with me and not rush and not pontificate by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'll help you understand what Jesus meant in context. Luke, you see what you did? You went on a tangent. You brought up a passage that they already have a response to embarrass you. Luke, do you want me to play the anti-Trinitarian and show you how they're going to turn that objection against you, brother? Because you're not listening. You thought you had a good argument because you haven't evangelized enough. That response tells me you don't do evangelism. Juan, God bless you. Zico, God bless you. Okay? Your response, Luke, shows me you don't evangelize anti-Trinitarians. It shows me you're right for an anti-Trinitarian to decimate you. Right? So do you want to be patient and listen and not pontificate like I said you shouldn't so you can get the most out of these sessions? Or do you want to try and impress me with knowledge you don't have and I'm not going to be impressed? Which is it? Folks, don't try and impress people or impress me. Impress Jesus. Not that the Lord can, can be impressed. So don't chime in thinking you got an airtight argument. You don't. You don't. Okay? Now, let me show you what it doesn't mean. When Jesus says the Father has given the Son to have life in himself, the Father has given the Son to have life in himself, that doesn't mean the Father brought the Son into being. That's not what life in himself means. Amy, are you upset? Amy, you, you know you got to leave now, right? Get Amy out of here, please. Get her out of here. I'm not going to tolerate distractions. Get her out of here, guys. Admins, quick. Shh, here, here. Let me be Christ-like. Shut up. Okay, let me be very gentle and, and Christ-like and humble because people see how humble I am. Shut up. Don't be used of the devil to distract. Zip. Let's not start what happened Tuesday. Okay. So now let me repeat the point. I'm going to show you from John 5, 26, when Jesus says the Father has given the Son life in himself, in John, that doesn't mean the Father gave Jesus life and that he brought the Son into being. That's not what it means. Are we now ready for the meat? Exactly. RIP, headphone users. Okay. I went over this Tuesday, but we got... So distracted by satanic attacks, I want to focus. That's why I'm not going to tolerate it now. Distractions, you're going to go like this. Okay. Let's go to John 6, 53 to show you the same language used in a context that clearly doesn't mean that these entities were brought into existence. John 6, 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Same language. You better eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to have life in you. Guys, let me ask you the question that I asked in the previous session. Jesus was talking to people who are alive, who are conscious, who are aware, who are existing. Do you see that life in them Cannot mean that they would be brought into being because they already were brought into being. They already had being. They already were conscious and aware and could hear what Jesus was saying. Right? Right? Thank you, Snow. You guys got it? He's talking to people who are alive and conscious and he says, you who are listening to me. You are aware and existing. You better eat my flesh, drink my blood, so you can have life in you. So notice life in them cannot mean they were brought into being. They were brought into life because they are already alive. 
right? So what did our Lord mean when he said, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood to have life in you? Let's read now John 6, 53 to 54. John 6, 53 to 54. Luis, I hope Luis is here because I want her to learn too. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Now here he explains what he means. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Ah, that's what it means for them to have life in themselves. Jesus says, if you eat my flesh, drink my blood, and believe in me, I will give you immortality. I will give you never-ending life. I will make you morally incorruptible, and I will raise you up physically, making your bodies indestructible. So what does it mean that they will receive life in themselves? It means he will give them never-ending immortal life. He will give them physical immortality and make them morally indestructible. So notice they're already alive. But he's going to give them that kind of life that never ends, where their bodies will be raised and never die, and they will never be able to sin again. But notice who's doing it? Jesus is. Jesus saying, I will give you that kind of life. Let's look at John 6, 54 one more time. Exactly in San Attic, in San, in San, whatever you say, man, your name. Whoso eat of my flesh and drink in my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Folks, let me ask you a question. What kind of ability must Jesus possess to give all believers, no matter how numerous, pay attention, to give all believers, no matter how numerous, no matter when they live, never-ending immortal life, and then raise them physically at the last day, making them immortal. What kind of attributes must he possess to do that for all believers, no matter how many they are, where they will live forever, and he will be the one to raise them physically at the last day? He must be almighty, and he must be all-knowing, omniscient, because he, he has to know who the believers are, right? He has to know this is a believer, this one's not. This one is eating my flesh, drinking my blood, and coming to me and remaining faithful to me by the power of the Holy Spirit. You I will preserve and raise up at the last day. So he must be omniscient, and he must be omnipotent, all-powerful. Okay, now, let's go to John 6 and read 39 to 40. John 6, 39 to 40. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, beholds the Son, believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Anyone who looks to you, believes in you, and keeps believing in you, remains united to you, you will raise up at the last day. You will resurrect physically and make them immortal to live forever. Yeah, I will do that. John 6, 44. John 6, 44. Notice what he says here. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Wow. Who do you think you are, Jesus, to physically resurrect every single believer who has lived and will live, making them immortal and morally incorruptible? Okay. Did that sink in? Did that sink in before I move on? We're going to go slow, methodical, because you're learning several things. You're learning about the Trinity. You're learning about Jesus being God and man. You're learning about salvation. Notice the promise of the Lord. Don't just read it as words. These are the words of the historical Jesus who walked this earth and said these things 
and he cannot lie, and he will do everything he just said. He will do everything he's promised. And what is his promise to every one of you? What is his promise to every one of you? Notice what he's saying to us. You come to me, believe in me, remain you in union with me, eating my flesh, drinking my blood, and I promise you, you will have everlasting life, and I will never lose any of you. I will raise you and make you immortal. Mark, let's change the subject and go into the drawing of the Father. Let's forget the point I'm trying to make, Mark. Thank you. Try to get me off topic. Okay. Everyone with me here? Okay. So when Jesus says to a group of folks that are alive, focus, guys. When Jesus says to a group of folks that are alive, okay, unless ye my flesh, drink my blood, you'll have no life in, in you. Was he saying they're not alive at all? That they didn't exist? That he was talking to nothing because they didn't have life in themselves, so they could not be alive and conscious and aware and have existence. So you've established, number one, having life in you doesn't mean you don't exist and you didn't already exist before you were given life in you. Notice here are people who don't have life in themselves but are still alive and conscious and aware and have existence. So number one, keep this in mind. John does not define the term life in yourself as, as meaning being brought into existence, being brought into being from a prior state of non-existence. That's not how he defines it. He's not saying that life in you means you went from non-existence to existence. That's not what it means. Right? That's not what it means. Everyone with me? So what does it mean when Jesus says the Father gave him life in himself? Now let's unpack. Second point. Let's go to John 5, 25 to 26. Now let's see what it means in context. Okay, pay attention now. Folks, don't be distracted by the devil. Focus. Okay. John 5, 25, 26. Here's where I need you to focus. Here's the answer. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. And then he explains why that's so. Why is it, Jesus, that when the dead hear your voice, they will live? And verse 26 explains it. For... And here's the explanation. When the dead hear my voice, they will live spiritually because the word four and 26 is now explaining why Jesus is able to make people alive spiritually when they hear his voice and believe. Here's why. Here's the reason. Because as the father has life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself. That's the explanation. What does he mean? He's not saying the Father brought me into being. No, no. The Father has life in himself, and I have life in myself. What does that mean? The Father and I have the ability to give life to others. The reason why those who hear my voice, the Son of God, and come to life is because my voice speaks life to them. Why? Because I have the ability in me to grant life to others. That's what he means. Did you get it? So again, what did Jesus mean when he said he has life in himself? In the context, he's saying, I have life in myself in that I have the ability to confer life Speak life and grant life to others. Just like the Father has the ability to confer life, speak life, and grant life to others. That's what it means in the context. The life in the Son is his ability to impart life to others. The life in the Father is the Father's ability to impart life to others. Let's look at it again. 
John 5, 25 to 26. So unless you don't see it, in case you're not seeing it, let's read it again. One more time. So scripture, I can't help it. If you don't get it, find another se session. F verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For, and here's the reason. Why is it those who hear your voice will live? Because as the Father has life in himself, so he has given the Son to have life in himself. Now, walk me through this, guys. What's the connection with Jesus having life in himself and those hearing the voice of the Son of God coming to life? Because verse 26 is explaining verse 25. Sola Scriptura. No, so I don't think this is for you. It's advanced, and I don't think you're on the level to get it yet, brother. I think you got to go, bro, honestly. Um, and it's an act of mercy for you because you're not getting this. This is beyond you. Send him uh, uh, away, guys. Get him. Uh, send him. He needs to go somewhere else. Go start with basics. Come back in a few years. Okay. All right. For the rest of you, you got it? What does it mean in the context of verse 26, the father has life in himself and the son has life in himself? The father has life in himself and the son has life in himself. What does that mean in the context? No, Jay, no. Because you guys are not listening, because you're so impatient, you want to get to the giving part, I can't get you to the giving part if you don't get this part first. What's wrong with you guys? How can I explain what it means the Father gave it to him if you don't first understand what it means for him to have life in himself? What is the matter with the Christians that they can't be patient? Why are you guys commenting on what it means for the son to be given life in himself? Why are you guys going ahead of me? Do you want me to now block all of you? Can we focus on the life in himself before we get to B? We're on A, you want to go to Z. You got to send Alex out of here too. Yeah, he's got to go. Okay. No, it doesn't mean that, Frankie. None of you are listening. Let's try it again. I'm going to start blocking people. I'm not kidding. I'm tired of this. Impatience won't make you last long with someone who's impatient. Okay. Yeah. Why, what does it mean for the son to have life in himself? What does it mean for the son to have life in himself? That's what I'm focusing on. And you're like, oh, giving it means they're one. <laughs> Okay. Do we get what it means now? Does it mean what it meant in John 6, 53 to 54, where he says to those who are alive, you need to eat my flesh, drink my blood to have life in yourself? No. There it meant when you eat my flesh, drink my blood, I'll give you everlasting life. That's what it means for them to have life in themselves. What does it mean when Jesus says, like the Father, so too I the Son have life in myself? What does that mean here? Let's see if you got it. Anna got it. Growing got it. Anna Growing got it. Ortho Christos got it. What does it mean again? No, it doesn't mean he's uncreated. No truth. Christ is almighty got it. Snow Leopard got it. First and the last got it. It means... He has the ability to impart life. I can give life like my father gives life. Like my father has the ability to give life, so he has granted me the ability to give life. I can give life like my father gives life. I have the ability to give life like my father has the ability to give life. That's what it means. Then we'll get to the giving part in a minute. 
So what's the proof that's what it means? I can't move on to the giving part if you don't first understand what it means for him to have life in himself. Okay? What's the proof that Jesus having life in himself means not that he was given life and brought into existence, but he has the ability to impart life. John 5, 25, 26. One more time. Exactly, Love Hunter. John 5, 25, 26. One more time. Now make the connection. Okay. Pay attention. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For, here's the reason, because as the Father has life in himself, so too he's given the Son life in himself. You understand? He's explaining how is it possible that he, the Son, can take spiritually dead people and make them alive just by the sound of his voice that they hear and obey. Is it making sense now? Who's not getting it? Who's not getting it? Because right there, you just destroyed the anti-Trinitarian lie. Do you know why? Because this passage is not saying the Father brought the Son into being. The Father created the Son or gave birth to the Son or brought the Son into being. That's not the point. The point is, like the Father has the ability to give life, I have the ability to give life. So right there, you destroy the anti-Trinitarian misinterpretation of John 5, 26. You tell the anti-Trinitarian, who told you life in, in the Son means the Father brought him into being, gave him his life, in other words, made him alive. Where did you get that from? That's not the meaning in the context. You understand now? There's someone confused. Let me know. Everyone got it? Okay. So the most you prove, this is what you prove. The most you prove that though Jesus existed before he was given life in himself there was a time in which he existed without the ability to give life to others that's all you prove you don't prove he was created or brought into being the most you prove and i'm going to refute that in a minute but just follow me the most this proves if the anti-trinitarian is right that jesus existed at a time in which he didn't have the ability to give life but this ability was given to him later, but he was already existing before he was given the ability to give life to others. That's all you're proving at most. But I'm not saying that's what it means. But you understand my point? That's all you're proving here. All you're proving is Jesus was already alive and existing consciously before the Father decided to allow his son to be given the ability to give life to others. You are not proving he was brought into being because that's not what the language means in the context. So now we want to answer the question. Now we want to answer the question. When did the Father give Jesus this ability to give life to others? See, that's the question now we're going to answer. See, if you're patient, you guys kept focusing on giving, giving, giving. That means they share. Be patient. Be patient. Be patient. Now we want to answer, when did the Father give the Son this ability to give life? Are we ready for that answer? I, I don't want to be too loud. I don't want to be a nuisance to my neighbors. Hopefully they'll get saved through the preaching. No. No. Uh, no, beyond fail. What did I just say about not pontificating? No, it's not anything to do with humanity. No, because it's the divine in Jesus that enables him to give life. 
No, it has nothing to do with his humanity. See, again, not patient. Okay, are we now ready to answer the question? It is not the human in Jesus that gives life. It's the divine in Jesus that gives life. Because giving life is a divine function. Only someone who's God can possess the ability to impart life. And yes, he is man, but because he's still God while he's, a, he's still man, because he's still God while man, as man who's still God, he can give life because he isn't man who stopped being God. He is man who's still God, the God man. Okay, now let me show you when the Father gave Jesus this ability to impart life. Are you ready? Are you ready? I know the Orthodox are loving me now. Because they're saying, man, that sounds like Orthodox theology, man. Okay. John 1, verses 1 to 4. John 1, verses 1 to 4. Patience, my friends. Patience. We will work through this, I promise you, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. John 1, verses 1 to 4. Now I need you to listen. John 1, verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Now, pay attention. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Folks, pay attention. Here John tells us the Word, who becomes Jesus was there before creation. Because notice verse 3, all things that were created was created by the Word. The Word was used by the Father to bring all creation into existence. And it says that at that moment, before creation came into being, he already had life in himself. And that was the life that made creation alive, that brought creation into life. That brought creation into being. So did you catch it? The word already had life in himself before all creation. And it's because he had life in himself, he was able to create and give life to all creation. Okay, folks, help me understand logic. If the word was there before all creation, and the word had life in him already before all creation... And it was that life in him that made all creation and gave life to all creation. Doesn't this mean that the word already had life in him before all creation came into being? According to John 1 verses 1 to 4. No, Karas, he can't. He won't capitalize it. No. So if the word already had life in him, God, us, you know you're going to get thrown out, right? Okay? Keep, keep pontificating. Tell us what to do on my channel. If the word had life in him before all creation was made, and it's that life in him that brought all creation into being and gave life to all creation, isn't this proof that the word already had life in him before all creation? You guys getting it? Before I move on? But wait, what do you have before all creation? Before all creation, what do you have? Eternity. Before all creation, eternity. Isn't this proof that the word already had life in him in eternity? He's eternally had life in him. Is it making sense now? Is it making sense now? Therefore, if you let John interpret his language, and you let John interpret his gospel, and not make John say something that goes against what John writes, John has just told you, the son has always had life in himself.
like the father has always had life in himself. And there wasn't a moment in time where the son did not have the life in himself. So there wasn't a time in which the son existed without the ability to give life. He's always had that ability. He's always had life in himself because he had it in himself before creation because he was there in eternity with the father. Thank you, Ariel. You answered it. John's gospel provides the answers to his own quotations of Jesus. That's why, Ariel, the session I did Tuesday was showing that the word of John 1, verses 118, is the same as Jesus of Nazareth who became flesh. So what is said of the word in the opening chapter is said of Jesus in the narrative. Because Jesus is the human enfleshment of that eternal word who's an eternal person who existed in eternity with the Father. Exactly, Christos and Esti. So, folks, if John has just introduced you to Jesus as the Word that existed in eternity before all creation, so he's not created, he's eternal by nature, and he eternally existed with the Father, and in eternity had life in himself, do you think John wants you to believe for a moment that there was a time in which the Son did not have life in himself? So there was a time in which the son lacked the ability to give life. Is that what John wants you to believe? Okay. So then why does he say the father gave the son life in himself? Ah. This is where we're indebted to those great men and women of the church. The holy slaves of Jesus Christ, the theologians, the apologists, the debaters, and the martyrs of the church of Jesus Christ, the early church. Welcome. Are you ready now to go into meet? Welcome to the wonderful world of the eternal begetting of the Son. Okay, why then did Jesus say the Father gave the Son his ability to give life to others? This is what we call the eternal begetting. Folks, keep in mind, God in his love and mercy has condescended to speak in human language, language that is imperfect, language that's limited, language that cannot perfectly describe the infinite God and his ways. So no matter how much we explain, human language will fall short of capturing the eternal reality of God. So whether you like it or not, God in his love and mercy condescends to speak in human language, a human language that's limited and cannot fully, perfectly explain God's eternal reality or how the members of the God relate to one another because our language is bound to time and it's limited and fallen and tainted by imperfect sinful humans, right? Okay. When Jesus says the father gave the son life in himself, he wasn't emphasizing time. Giving here doesn't mean a moment in time. The Lord is using human language to describe an eternal reality, an eternal relationship that's timeless. You with me there? Timeless. So when he says give, he doesn't mean in a moment of time. The language is this life I have comes from the Father who's the source of the divine nature and the divine abilities, which I partake of fully, completely, and eternally. So it's not giving the Son in a moment of time. Giving in the sense of the Father's essence is the Son's essence and the Spirit's essence, so that the Son's essence, right, comes from the Father, who's the source of that essence, 
which the Son and the Spirit have eternally shared in perfectly, completely, and inseparably. You with me there? That's all it's saying. Not giving in a moment of time. Giving in the sense that it's the Father's life. That's my life. That's the Spirit's life. Because the Father is the source of the divine essence, which I, the Son, and the Spirit have eternally, inseparably <clears throat> possessed because we are eternally, inseparably united to Him. You understand what the language is conveying? And I'm going to give you an analogy that the Bible uses, which the church fathers use and ran with. Okay. I'm going to give you an analogy, which is based on Scripture. No analogy is identical to God, but you have to use analogies to get an idea of God's eternal being and reality. Get an idea. You won't fully comprehend. Hebrews 1.3 for the analogy. And I'm going to use John 1 to prove my point. Hebrews 1.3. Okay. Watch here, guys. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty and I. Now, I want you to pay attention to that word brightness. Who being the brightness of of his glory, brightness. Okay. The Greek word is, again, guys, forgive me, Greek uh, speakers. I'm going to pronounce it the Erasmian way. Apa, apa gazma. Apa gazma. Gazma. Apo gazma. Apo gazma. Apo gazma. O kirius mu. O kirius mu. O theus mu. Monogeni. Monogeni. All right. Apo gazma. Now, Apogasma, that Greek word. Do you see it? Apogasma. That word refers to the outshining, the radiance of an object that emits light. So I'm going to give you the analogy of the sun, S-U-N. The apogasma of the sun, S-U-N, is the light that radiates to us. When you see the light of the sun, you're seeing the apogasma of the sun. Are you with me there? So this word refers to the radiance, the outshining of a shiny object. Are you with me there? So we're going to use the sun again, S-U-N, sun. Okay. The apogasma of the sun, the, the radiance of the sun is the light. Okay. The light of the sun is the apogasma, the radiance of the sun. Now notice, the light originates from the sun. The sun generates light and sends forth light to us. But because the light is inseparable from the sun and originates from the sun, the light has the same essence that the sun possesses. It's not a different essence. It's the same essence of the sun. Because the sun does not radiate something other than its own essence. Right? So what is the source of the light? The sun. And because the light originates from the sun, and the sun <clears throat> shines forth the light, the light is of the same essence of the sun. But moreover, here's where the, you'll see analogy to the Trinity. The sun, S-U-N, cannot be the sun without light and heat. So there is a moment in which the sun doesn't have light. It's no longer a sun. So for the sun to be what it is, it always has to exist with the very light that it generates. And it always has to exist with the very heat that it generates. So now notice, the sun generates heat and light, but though it generates it, it always has to exist with heat and light for it to be the sun. Because if there's a moment in which the sun doesn't have light or heat, it's no longer the sun. You with me there? No, I'm not using the word character, Azul. That's where it says he's the exact imprint of God's substance. Hupo stasos or stasios. Okay, you with me there? 
Sun begetting light, not light begetting sun. And it's an analogy, Leo, because it's scriptural. It's inspired by the Spirit, Hebrews 1, verse 3. So how does this tie in with the Father? The Father's radiance, the Father's outshining is his Son. His Son is the radiance of his glory. So the Father is the source of that radiance. And being the source of that radiance, the radiance is of the same substance of the Father. It can't be otherwise. But the Father cannot be the Father without his radiance. The Father cannot be the Father without his Son. So that means for the Father to be who he is, he's always existed with the Son with his radiance. Even though he's the source of that radiance. Making sense? So what's the source of Jesus' essence? The Father. He's the source. But the Son has always existed inseparably from the Father. So he's always existed as a participant or partaker of the essence of the Father. So the Father's essence, essence has always been his. Because he's always inseparably been united to him. Exactly, Atheist Anonymous. Exactly, Luvantur. The Holy Spirit would be likened to the heat because he puts us on fire for God. He sets our hearts on fire for God. Exactly. Did it make sense? How one thing can be the source of another... Without this implying that the source is older than the thing that originates from it. Right? I want this to sink in before I move on to the next point. The sun in the sky is the source of the light. And yet the sun cannot be the sun without the light. So it's always existed with the light. That originates from it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the sun. Making sense? And this is where you have to praise the triune God, praise the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, for our spiritual ancestors, these theological, holy men and women of God, whose writings have been preserved because God's Spirit moved them into these insights. So praise God for the Athanasiuses. Praise God for the Alexanders. Praise God for the Justin Martyrs. Praise God for the Tertullians. Praise God for the Ignatiuses. These are the men who, by the power of the Holy Spirit, dug deep into the language of Scripture and tried to explain this eternal reality in the most befitting manner and remaining faithful to Scripture as to not rob any of the persons of the Godhead of their eternal dignity. Yep, the Cappadocians' father, Basil, Gregory, all of them. Praise God for them. Because they were being faithful to Scripture. They were doing their best to explain Scripture. And I'm going to show you John 1. John 1 teaches the same thing. But it's so, it's so subtle you miss it unless you have been trained in the creeds and the fathers. So the Orthodox here, even the Catholics here, even the Coptics, believe it or not, get it. They get it because they've been trained in this heritage. Okay, now let me, let me show you how John itself shows this. The Gospel of John shows this. Yes, conservative. Go back from the beginning and listen. Okay, let me show you. Let's go to John 1 again. John 1, 1. John 1, 1. Yep, the Church of the East, them too. Our ancestors. I call them historian, but we shouldn't call them historian king of Syria because they're going to think we were heretics, that we believe there was a divine person and a human person that united. No, it's one divine Christ who became flesh. Anyway, here, John 1, 1. Folks. It's right here in front of your eyes. It's right here in front of your eyes. Right here, John is telling you, the Father is the source. 
Right here, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hey, guys, last time I checked, if Jesus is the Word of God, that means God is the source of the Word, right? He's the Word of God. That's Revelation 19.13. Jesus called the Word of God. The Word of God. But wait, if Jesus is God's Word, doesn't mean doesn't that mean God is the source? The Word originates from Him. He's the source of that Word. Notice the Father is not the word of Jesus. Jesus is the word of the Father. This language again implies source. The word originates from the Father. The Father is the source of the word. But the Father has always existed with his word because he wasn't devoid of word. He wasn't wordless. He's always been existing with his word, even though he's the source of that word. Making sense? Speakers are the source of words. Ariel, you're killing me, man. You, you keep doing the reverse. Yep, you can do that too, Leventer, because when you form words, you use breath. But we can't press it too literally. Why? Because God is not a physical being who physically breathes. But you with me there? John 1 told you to expect that later in his narrative, you're going to find Jesus saying, the Father gives me, the Father grants me, the Father hands over to me. Why? Because the Father is the source, and the Son eternally, inseparably shares in that source. Because the Father cannot be who he is, independent from the Son, and the Son cannot be who he is, independent from the Father, and the same is true with the Holy Spirit. Is it making sense or no? So you understand what John 5, 26 does not mean? It does not mean that the Son was brought into life, nor does it mean that there was a time in which the Son didn't have ability to give life and only had it when the Father gave it to him in time. That's not what John 5, 26 is teaching. I'm not confused, just the hero. If you're confused... Then what can I tell you? So Father, Son, and Spirit are independent of all creation, need nothing, need no one for their life and existence. But they cannot be what they are apart from the others. The Father could not be who he is without the Son and the Spirit. The Son could not be who he is without the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit could not be who he is without the Father and the Son. So they are inseparable from one another and interdependent. And yet they don't need anything or anyone outside of their own being to be who they are. Right? God bless you too, Anna. Are you leaving, Anna? You're scaring me. Don't leave, sister. Everyone with me there before I move on? I want it to sink in. I don't want to move on. Until this becomes second nature. So do you see that even John is preparing you for John 5, 26? Who is the word of God? The father or the son? The son. The Son is the Word of God the Father. But right there, you're supposed to be thinking to yourself. And that's where the church fathers got it. The church fathers got it. They saw, wait, the Son is the Logos, the Logos of God. That means he's the reason of God in his mind. That means God is the source of that Logos. That means the Logos is inseparable from him. That means the Logos has always existed within God as a part of God. Because God has never been without his Logos. But at the same time, God is the source of that Logos because it springs from him. It originates from him, but it's eternal. Clear? Now you appreciate the Nicene Creed. Now you appreciate the Nicene Creed. Do me a favor. Either First Nice or Protestant. Pope. 
post the part where it talks about one God the Father, then Jesus Christ divinity. God from God, light from light, true light from true light. Now you should say glory to Jesus for such a beautiful creed that accurately, perfectly, succinctly encapsulates and captures what the Bible teaches about the Trinity and the humanity of Christ. I don't know, Michelle. You're giving me too much credit, brother. I love you. You're more qualified than me to talk about the creeds because you are a solid Orthodox who knows your heritage better than me. Remember, I was reared among Protestants. I'm learning this as I go along, as I hear from a variety of opinions, and trusting the Holy Spirit to sanctify me and guide me into all truth. Okay, let's read. First last posted it. First last posted it. Well, they both posted it. I don't know. Okay, can we have one of you guys posting it? Who's going to post it? I don't get confused. Who's going to? Okay, first last is posting. Guys, pay attention. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Sorry, Michelle. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before, before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Do you understand now what that means? What does it mean when the creed says he's God from God, light from light, true God from true God? You ever wondered what the creeds meant when they state that? Why are they saying Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God? That's the language of begetting, beginning. That's the language of source. Jesus is God from the essence of God. The Father's essence is his essence. The Father is the source of that divine essence. And Jesus is God from the essence of God, which he shares in eternally, inseparably, and perfectly. He is light from light. True God from true God. Exactly, Timothy. You catching it now? I need to write a book. There are many people who wrote a book, first and last. Who am I to be writing a book? So before I move on, amen, Anna. Who's not getting it? But understand, this teaching shows you the Godhead cannot exist apart from one another. They cannot exist apart from the other. Thank you, Steve. God bless you. Okay. They are interdependent and madly in love with one another. Right? The Father is the Father because of the Son and the Spirit. The Son is the Son because of the Father. The Spirit is the Spirit because, you understand? The one depends on the others, and they complete the others. They can't be what they are apart from the others. This shows you their perfect and separable union. There is no God that's not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is no God without the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Father isn't God apart from the Son and the Spirit. And the Son isn't God apart from the Father and the Spirit. And the Spirit, Spirit isn't God apart from the Father and the Son. Making sense? And go back to that analogy which we got from Hebrews 1, 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The Son in space isn't the Son apart from the light and the heat. And the light cannot be the light apart from the sun and the heat. And the heat cannot be the heat apart from the sun. In other words, for the sun to be what it is, it needs its light and heat. And yet there would be no light if there was no sun. There would be no heat if there was no sun. You'd have a supernova or nothing at all. That's Hebrews 1.3. I didn't make it up. I have no idea what you mean by Ab Alo from another. If the Godhead is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there is no God apart from Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And therefore, for God to be God, he is the Father and unit the Son and the Spirit. So I have no idea what you're talking about, conservative Methodism. Don't impose your imperfection and stupidity upon an eternal reality. There is no God apart from Jesus. How much clearer can I make it? Do I need to dumb it down a little more? 
There is no God apart from Jesus because the Father couldn't be who he is apart from the Son. You want me to dumb it down, stupefy it to go to your level? Help, I, you know, I can go on kindergarten level if you want. God bless you. Thank you for the super chat. How can you have God without Jesus? How can the, the Father be who he is without Jesus? I thought I made it clear the first 50 times I said it. Everyone got it, but for some reason you don't want to get it because you want to think you're philosophically astute and sophisticated. See, I'm a conservative Methodism. I'm philosophically astute, sophisticated. So I think on a higher level. You see, I'm going deep. Ab, ab, ab. Try and impress me with Latin. Don't ever try to pull that on me, dude. You don't impress me. You disgust me. Trying to sound intelligent. I'm See, Sam Shimon, I can say ab owl and assay. See, I can speak Latin. See, I'm cool. Ha ha. No, you're an idiot. Don't ever try and impress me. I get offended when people try to pontificate and sound articulate, and they are only exposing their stupidity. Luke, I'll give you a million bucks if you show me and Aaron using the sun analogy. Luke, you better now confirm what you just said. Quote me an Aaron that uses a sun analogy or I'm going to have to block you. Okay. Oh, I'm going to go give Luke a chance to vindicate what he just said. No, you were trying, conservative, because you didn't have to speak of alo and essay unless you're trying to impress us with your stupidity, because I'm not impressed. Don't ever come here and start using theological, philosophical jargon, because I don't like arrogant know-it-alls, and that's what you are. So don't play humble now. Okay. He's a c case of a bully, a spiritual bully, to try and impress you with his theological jargon. And you, you do it with bullies, you put them in their place. Luke, I'm going to block you after I give you an answer. Okay. Can the sun be a, the sun without the light and without the heat? Because I'm going to block you right after this. And conservative is going to follow you shortly. If there is no heat and light, is the sun the sun? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you on your merry way. Is the sun a sun without heat and light? I already explained, no, it's either a supernova because it's burned out or it doesn't exist as the sun. Okay? When you say sun, you're saying an object that produces heat and generates light. Otherwise, it makes no sense to call something a sun that doesn't have those properties. How can the sun be the sun without those properties? Please help me understand because I'm stupid. Maybe you can throw some Latin terms to impress me too. Here, throw some Latin terms. Folks, help me because I'm a little stupid. Isn't it true when you say sun, you mean a shining object that produces heat and generates light? Because if it doesn't have heat and light, then it's not a sun. It's either a supernova that burned out or it's not a sun. It doesn't exist. So, Luke, throw some Latin terms like conservative Methodism and impress me. Impress me a little bit. Throw some Latin terms. Because I thought I was clear. The sun is not the sun, S-U-N. If it doesn't have heat and light, I don't know how much clear I can make it. Yeah, what they call a supernova, right, Alex? It burned out. Right? So to tell me, well, no, the, the, the heat and the light are emanations of the sun, and it's separate from the... It can't be separate from the sun for the sun to be what it is. How do you say light and heat are separate from the sun? You take away light and heat, it's not the sun anymore. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? You're separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, ab allo, assay. <laughs> Don't I sound intelligent?
right? So let me impress you guys Latin. See, you know it's true because I said, ap alo, assay. <laughs> anyway, for the rest of you, did you get the point? And again, I'm not saying the Trinity is identical to the sun, that shining object. Of course it isn't. It's an analogy, one based on scripture. Okay? Because the Godhead is not a physical object, a material object, right? And the Godhead is timeless, right? Is that clear? So do we answer the objection to John 5, 26? Can I sum it up real quickly? Sum it up, because there was a question about Matthew 16, 28 that I'll address. Can I sum it up real quickly? Okay. John 5, 26. Are we ready? Okay. John 5, 26. When Jesus says the Father has given the Son to have life in himself, life in himself does not mean in the Gospel of John that God brought the Son into being. God made the Son alive. That's not what life in himself means. Life in himself in the context means... The ability to give life. The Father has life in himself. The Son has life in himself. What does that mean in context? Father and Son have the divine ability to impart life to others. That's all it means. It's related to that. Even if Jesus meant, follow with me, even if Jesus meant that there was a point in time he didn't have life in himself, all you're proving is there was a point in time where the son existed without the ability to give life to, to others. It doesn't mean he didn't always exist. All you're proving is, though he always existed, he didn't always exist with the ability to give life to others. But we know that's not the meaning either. That's not the meaning either because point number three, John 1 already showed us. John 1 already showed us that Jesus is the word before he became man. And as the word, he's an eternal person that existed in eternity before all creation. And in eternity, he had life in himself. And that was that life in him that brought creation into being and gave life to all creation. So John 1 has already affirmed before you came to John 5, which comes four chapters later. He's already began his gospel by letting you know this word existed in eternity with life in himself and because he has the ability to give life he created all things and gave life to all things and that word later becomes the man jesus but like ariel said but sam ab allo and philo is in a pickle even the dogs are barking see even muhammad is barking down muhammad down Right? Clear? Everyone got that? Made sense to everybody? Muhammad, it's okay. You'll get to smooch the black stone some other time. I don't mean to insult dogs. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Don't insult dogs, Frank Christian. So everyone is on the page with me. The Father can be the source without the Son being a creature, right? That's why reacquaint yourselves with the creeds of Christendom and reacquaint yourself with the writings of some of the fathers, right? You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I form terms. And I write it out because that's how I form these conceptual ideas. Okay. Stop while you're ahead, conservative. Please, brother, stop while you're ahead. You already start, start off at a <clears throat> bad foot with me. Reacquaint yourself with the church fathers and their articulation of the Trinity. Okay. Some of the fathers were not as precise in their articulation as later fathers, but they still affirm the eternal, uncreated, 
nature of God, Jesus the Word, and the Holy Spirit. So they were still Trinitarians. But the way Justin Martyr, the way Tertullian, the way Irenaeus articulated it, wasn't as precise as later generations, but still they did their best with the language of the scriptures because they could see, wait, if Jesus is the Logos, Logos can also mean reason. Oh, so John is saying that Jesus is the eternal reason in God's mind. So God has always existed with his reason. And then he's brought forth, some, some, summoned forth, begotten out of the very heart of God, out of the, out of the mind of God. Right? And by the way, I have articles on this on my blog, if you want them. I have a series of articles on the Trinitarianism, Christology of Justin Martyr, of Ignatius, of Tertullian, and other church fathers, if you want me to post the links here. Do you want the links? Do you want the links? All right. Here you go. Here's link number one. Are you ready to save these links now? Here you go then. Link number one, Ignatius. Ignatius. What did you leave about the Trinity? That's one. Because I got tired of the Joe's Witnesses and the other heretics of misquoting these fathers, making them something they weren't. Link number two, Justin Martyr. What did he believe about the Trinity and about Jesus? Link number two, Justin Martyr. There you go. Click on the links, save them, upload them to your websites, print them out, use them. And then I give you links where you can read their writings online for free. That was link number two, Justin Martyr. Okay. Now let me get you Tertullian. Link number three. Tertullian and the Doctrine of the Trinity. Link number three. You got it? That's the third link. Hopefully one of the mods will put it in the description box. Okay. Link number four. Did the anti-Nicene fathers, the fathers writing before Nicaea, worship the Holy Spirit as God Almighty? Did they believe the Holy Spirit is God Almighty and worthy of worship? Here you go. Link number four. The fathers before Nicaea worshiped the Holy Spirit as God Almighty. Did you get it? That was four articles so far. Okay. I got more. So you guys got to pray for me. Pray for the ministry. Pray for my holiness. Pray for my purity. Pray for my daughters and pray for the provision that God will sustain me until the race is finished and he calls me home for his glory in Jesus' name. Okay. Link number five. Were the early church fathers Trinitarians? Link number five. Were the early church fathers Trinitarians? That's the fifth link. Oh, I'm not done. Hold on, man. A little haters. Why you hate? Participate. Blah, 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 blah. Link number six. How did the early church fathers interpret the Old Testament passages where God uses plural pronouns to speak of himself. Here is a link, and this one's you're going to love. Link number six. Here's a link showing you that the church fathers interpreted Genesis 1.26, where God says, let us make man in our image, as the Father speaking to the Son and the Spirit. They believe John 1, Genesis 1.26 was the Trinity speaking, the Father speaking to the Son and the Spirit. Unlike what modern evangelical scholars say, that God was talking to the angels. If I was a betting man, I would be betting on the fathers and I'd agree with them over against these silly, sissified, compromised scholars of today. So there you have it. Six links, folks. But now, here are also two links, not directly related to the church fathers, but related to refuting anti-Trinitarians. Because I did a multi-part series on refuting the Muslim misuse of Matthew 4, verse 10, where Jesus says to the devil, worship God alone, and Revelation 22, 8 to 9, 
where the angel told, tells John, as the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue and anoints the sound of my words to glorify Jesus and bless you, where the angel tells John, hey, don't worship me, I'm just a slave. A Muslim try to use those passages to say, you see, Jesus is in God and God is in a trinity. I did a multi-part session on that just a couple weeks ago, and here's my two-part article on it. So save these articles. Part one. A lot of mean in the articles and in the sessions. Part one. I posted six, sister, so I don't know what to tell you. Tell you to me. Maybe you need to call me. You need to wake up. But you can go to the website or the blog and put in Trinity and Church Fathers. You get all that. And here's part two. All together, I just gave you eight links. Eight links. And God willing, one of the mods is going to put it in the description box. Now, with that said, let me answer Matthew 16, 28. Can I answer Matthew 16, 28? There was a brother here who asked me to answer. Is his name Zigvur? Zigur? I forget. I couldn't pronounce his name. Where is the brother that asked me about Matthew 16, 28? He's not here? Well, Lion Bear, I have over 300 articles... 90% of which focus on the Trinity. Jesus as the God-man, the Holy Spirit as a person, who is God, the authority of the Bible, salvation, on my blog and on the website, answeringislam.net. Look for individual authors and Sam Shamoon. And even on my YouTube channel, I've been doing live streams for about two years. So if you go back, I have a lot of sessions on a lot of these topics, stuff I already covered. Study the material, Absorb them until they become second nature. Share them with people for the glory of Jesus and use them. If the brother's not here in Matthew 16, 28, I can still answer it for you guys if you want. Matthew 16, 28. Let's look at it. Matthew 16. Are you calling me Bishop Fulton Sheen? Me? I'm, I'm better looking. Okay, let's look at Matthew 16, 28. And I'm going to end it with this. Don't forget tomorrow, God willing, Lord willing, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live with David Wood. In this session, you get 1,500. But glory to God, we're up to about 240 today. And I hope it keeps increasing for the glory of Christ. Matthew 16, 28. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Do you guys want to know what it means? Now, Mexican, thank you, brother. For calling me a handsome Christian. But I hope you mean it platonically. As a brother in Christ. You're not stumbling because of my good looks. You guys want to know what it means? See already we got Doc Savage commenting. Why? Why? Okay. Matthew 16, 28. Do you want me to answer that? Remember, because we're live streaming, things happen that are beyond our control and are growing. Be careful, sister. You make me. You may make me fall in love with the Orthodox Church so I can marry an Orthodox Christian woman who's on fire for Jesus. So be careful now. I bet you're praying for that, aren't you? Okay, anyway. okay right here. I got to do one thing. It's live stream, so I'm going to answer this. Okay, listen. You do, I'm going crazy. 
I'd rather be alone. And I know my life would be so lonely as soon as you were gone. Impossibility with you. I, I got to practice. My voice is going. <clears throat> I love this song. Marcus, I hope you love me platonically, brother. If you are a Marsha, then I would be flattered. But glory to Jesus Christ, okay? <clears throat> are you ready now? Matthew 16, 28. What does it mean? Matthew 16, 28. Really, Acts 17 apologetics? Tomorrow I'm going to be carrying dead weight on your live stream. Okay. Let's be fairly, I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What does that mean? Okay, now focus with me as we unpack this. Are you aware that Matthew, Mark, and Luke mentioned the seeing of Jesus? Okay, guys, pay attention to what it means. Okay, because this is often used to try to show that Jesus made a false prophecy. Okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke mentioned the saying of Jesus. And are you aware... That all three of them follow up Jesus' saying immediately with Jesus going on the mount to be transfigured. Did you know that? Matthew, Mark, Luke. After mentioning this saying of Jesus, followed up immediately with Jesus going to a high mountain with three disciples, Peter, James, and John, about a week later, and transfiguring before them with Moses and Elijah appearing. Go to Mark 9, verse 1, and Luke 9, 20, 27. Mark 9, verse 1, and Luke 9, 27. Yep, Chris Marcos, amen. Mark 9, verse 1, and Luke 9, 27. And he, okay, Protestant, is the Alzheimer's kicking in again, friend? I'm getting sick caring you too, bro. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. Which part of Mark 9 verse 1 wasn't clear? The verse or the one? Mark 9 verse 1. Before the rapture, uh, Protestant. Because we're going to leave you behind. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there will be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Did you notice it? So Mark mentions the same saying of Jesus. Luke 9, 27. Luke 9, 27. But I tell you the truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. So all three mentioned the saying of Jesus, right? And all three followed up with Jesus going to a high mountain a week later. Matthew 17, verse 1. Mark 9, verse 2. Luke 9, 28. Matthew 17, verse 1, Mark 9, verse 2, Luke 9, 28. Matthew 17, verse 1, Mark 9, verse 2, Luke 9, verse 28. Watch here. So you're going to see what he means here. And after <clears throat> six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringing them up into a high mountain apart. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him, Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up <clears throat> into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. Are you seeing the pattern here? It's not a coincidence, right, that after Jesus said, there are some standing here who will see the kingdom of God coming in power, in glory, seeing the Son of Man come in power and glory, right, before dying. And all three Gospels then followed up with Jesus taking some disciples, only three, Peter, James, and John, on a high mountain and transformed before them, seeing Moses and Elijah and seeing the cloud and hearing the voice of the Father. So let's go to Matthew 17, verses 2 to 5. Matthew 17, verses 2 to 5.
Watch here. Yep, Kenneth, now you do. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Right? And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Now notice five, verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a, vo a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now Matthew 17, verses 6 to 9. Matthew 17, verses 6 to 9. And here's your answer, and we're done. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid, greatly afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. Now watch here, verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. You understand what Matthew, Mark, Luke want you to see. Jesus fulfilled that promise when he took some, three disciples, Peter, James, and John, on a mount, transfigured before them, giving them a taste of what he looks like in his kingdom, in his glory, and what he will look like when he comes in his kingdom, in his glory. That's what Jesus meant. I'm going to show you how I appear when I'm in heaven, in my glory, and how I'm going to look and appear when I come in glory to establish my kingdom on earth. I'm not going to look like an ordinary human being. I'm going to radiate with the divine light a glory that the world will behold, a glory that the world will see and realize that I who come am no ordinary man, but the divine son of God, the God man who's coming in my kingdom to judge the living and the dead. So he gave them a taste of that and said, it was for you to see, tell no one. Until I'm raised, then you can recount the story. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 18. That's the meaning. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 18. Exactly. And notice it was some of them, right? Not all of them. Now notice what Peter writes. Now remember what Jesus said? Don't share this until after the resurrection. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written after the resurrection. So they were faithful to Jesus' promise. Now notice what Peter writes. Peter writes of this experience. 2 Peter 1, 16, 18. Notice what he says. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming. Ah, the power and coming. There's that language. Some of you will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Notice what he said. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we saw his majesty. When did you see it, Peter? For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now notice verse 18. Notice verse 18. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. There you go. That's the answer. Exactly, Ariel. Not everyone saw it, right? Only a few did. Okay, so that's the meaning of the passage. Jesus giving them a foretaste of what I will look like when I appear in my heavenly kingdom, what I look like now in heaven to those who come and dwell in my presence in heaven. Some of you seen it before dying, but not everyone will. Some of you and Peter, James, and John saw it before they died. No one else did. No one else did, right? So with that said, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah, God Almighty in the flesh. The eternal Son of the Father, who is one with Him and the Spirit, inseparably and perfectly 
and eternally. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, sooner than later. And, Lord, we ask that you wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus. Fill us with your love. Seal us by your spirit. Never let us fail you, betray you, deny you, or blaspheme your name. But the work you began in us, completed by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we love you more, glorify you more, live for you more, preach more, and even die for you if necessary, and never betray you. And Lord Jesus, sustain us until you take us home, until you come, and provide our daily bread. Nourish us spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically, and our loved ones. My daughter, nourish them and flood them in your love, and save them from irreparable harm, Lord Jesus. And save me from this wicked system, wicked judges. And convict their mother to fear you and repent, Lord Jesus. And bless everyone here. Bless them mightily, Lord. And if you're pleased to use me, continue to increase my understanding and knowledge and wisdom. To bless them so that we can stand in awe of your word. And marvel at how beautiful and glorious you are. Because you are real. You are alive. You are life. And you can never die. And help us to die in union with you. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. The Father and the Spirit love and adore you. And we do too, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hit the like button, subscribe, invite people, read the articles, use them for the glory of Christ. And don't forget tomorrow, God willing, tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, David Wood, Hater Wood's channel. I'll be with him live. Christ was risen, risen indeed. Take care, guys. And pray for my miracle. Pray for my daughters. Pray God will save me and them and not cause me to fall into depression because of their predicament. Please, my heart aches for them and they ache for me. I know Jesus loves them more than I can imagine. And he loves you too. Take care.